If I'm BYU, I'm really upset. All right, first and foremost, one, I run the risk of not securing a first-round bye if Boise State ends up in front of me. So the fact that there's only a margin of three spots between 12 with Boise State and BYU at nine is ridiculous. Hello and welcome in. It's always college football. I'm your host, Greg McElroy, and we appreciate you being here. All right, we have just finished up the College Football Playoff Committee ranking show just a moment ago. Tons of takeaways. And I know that in that hour-long show, we hit a lot of different topics and we hit a bunch of different segments and conversations, but they're finite. That's the beauty of always college football. We get to go back and we get to assess and we'll go one through 25. Who should feel snubbed? Who should feel great? Some conclusions that we can potentially come to based on what we've seen from the committee so far and tell you a few things that I think are worth noting based on what just transpired. As always, like, rate, and subscribe to the show wherever you get your show. We appreciate you guys very much for the support that you've shown us. I am in Bristol, Connecticut right now, uh, still wearing a tie, but time to get down to business. Without much, I guess, without much panic in the air, I'm going to tell you why these rankings do matter. A lot of people continually say, you know what? First ranking doesn't matter. All right. Tell that to the teams that are not well positioned, and I'll tell you who they are because I think there's a handful. Like I said, like, rate, subscribe. Check us out on the podcast. Check us out on the YouTube channel. We're always college football. So for those of you you that are new, welcome in. We're going to have some fun. Let's dive in to the College Football Playoff Committee's first rankings release. We will start at the top, right? We'll start there. I, I don't know anybody that has a problem with Oregon being number one, right? We're all on the same page, okay? We're all feeling good about where Oregon's at. No pushback there, right? They're 9-0. and They have a great win against Ohio State. They have looked really convincing on both sides of the ball. Their offensive and defensive fishing numbers are off the charts good. Like, got no problems whatsoever with Oregon being where they're at right now. Good. So let's not waste any more time there. We're good at one. Let's go to two. Ohio State. Should they be two? Their best wins against Penn State. I think that's a pretty good win. The committee does too. The committee has Penn State at number six. Should Penn State be six? No, but I'll explain more on that here in just a minute. Ohio State, I think, because based off listening to Ward Manuel, the chairman of the College Football Playoff Committee, he basically said that because of who Ohio State lost to, and how they lost, that's why they have the edge in front of Georgia. There's, that's fine. I don't have an opinion on it. To me, I, whether you lost by 1, 10, 15, 20, I kind of think that I'm fine with the team that lost by less. You get blown out. Is that an indicator of a, a deeper flaw? Perhaps. I, I don't have a problem with their reasoning whatsoever because to me, Ohio State and Georgia are interchangeable. Whether you're two, whether you're three, it doesn't really matter. They both have really good wins. Georgia's against Texas. Ohio State's against Penn State. Either way, I feel fine with those two teams. So any time spent on that kind of sequence, two, three, to me feels like it's wasted time. And it will also resolve itself. Basically, the SEC and Big Ten, the champions, will be one and two, and we'll go from there, right? At number four, it's Miami. Not sure how anyone at this point can push back there. There was a time where you could probably make a pretty clear argument that Miami hadn't really played anybody, but the last couple of weeks they've now beaten a Louisville team that has come on strong and is 6-3 and three, and a Louisville team that is currently residing in the College Football Playoff Committee's top 22. So they have a good win there, and they have a good win against 6-3 Duke. And Duke isn't in the top 25, but 6-3 is 6-3. and three. Miami is appropriately ranked Number four, number five, that's where we start to have some problems. Okay. And I believe, and I would think most of you believe that Texas is among the top teams in the sport. I, I believe that. Um, I think, I think they're very capable of going and winning a national championship. I think all that is completely within the realm of possibility. And you know what? Let's just for the sake of argument here. Let's actually pair these three teams together. Okay, Texas, Penn State, and Tennessee. Let's pair those three teams together, shall we? 
Let's start with Texas. What is their best win? I'll give you a second to think about it. The answer is against a 6-3 and three Vanderbilt team who's not ranked right now. Maybe the, you can make a case that they should be ranked or that they shouldn't be ranked, but that's their best win. Their next best win against a Power 5 team is against a 5-4 and four Oklahoma. Based on record alone, Vanderbilt 6-3, and three, Colorado State's their next best win after that. They're 6-3 and three as well, but that's a G5 team, and I don't think you're going to get a lot of bonus points for your best win outside of Vanderbilt being a G5 team. So Texas, their best win is against Vandy, and they lost convincingly to the Georgia Bulldogs on their home field. Okay, so that's Texas's resume in a nutshell. Do I think Texas is really good? Of course. Do I think I test, they pass it? Of course. But the resume doesn't justify being ranked fifth. But it's not just picking on Texas here, because the most egregious example of a team that is currently being completely overvalued is Penn State. Penn State, their best win this year is against Illinois. And while I have watched Illinois, I'm sure most of you have watched Illinois, I'm not sure anyone is going to come away from watching the Illini this year and thinking, you know what, that's a great, that's a that's a program-defining win. It's not. I mean, Illinois is a good football team. They're 6-3. and three. You deserve tons of credit for beating a team 6-3. and three. But if that's your best moment and your next best win is against a Wisconsin team that has had their doors blown off a couple times, then what are we doing here? Penn State has no business being number six. And honestly, Texas, I don't know if they have a ton of business being number five based on resume. Then we get to Tennessee. And while Tennessee has had multiple moments this year in which they look a little lethargic, right? Not great, right? Not great whatsoever. They do have a win against Alabama. It's a really good win. Alabama currently sits in the top 11 of the college football playoff committee rankings. So they have the best win of the bunch. Do they have the worst loss? Yeah, technically they lost to Arkansas, where Texas lost to Georgia, Penn State lost to Ohio State. So are we valuing who you lost to now? Because that would be new from the committee. We have not had that from previous versions of the college football committee. They don't factor in as much who you lost to, but more how many times you lost or what the margin of defeat might have been. So in my opinion, those three teams... Texas, Tennessee, Penn State all have solid resumes, but far from elite resumes. Penn State and Texas don't have a top 25 win. Tennessee has one, and that would be against Alabama, which is why I think Tennessee should be ahead of both Texas and Penn State. And then I'll go one step further. You know who should be ahead of Texas and Penn State potentially? BYU. BYU, who currently sits right now, according to the playoff committee, at number nine, they, of all people, should feel the most slighted right now. Because I look at Indiana, who sits right in front of them, and I think Indiana is appropriately ranked. Because Indiana still has so much meat left on the bone. Like, if I'm Indiana today, hey, I'm pumped to be there. The committee recognizes that we've stomped everyone we've played. We're a good football team. We can execute at a high level. We've seen our offense do it. We've seen our defense do it. We've done it without our starting quarterback. Like, Indiana's in a great spot. So I don't feel like they're really worth discussing because their strength of schedule up to this point is at 103. Indiana's in full control of their own destiny. They have Ohio State on the schedule in a couple weeks. They have Michigan coming to them. Indiana's likely going to be in the college football playoff, barring something completely unforeseen. But at the same time, I think they're in a good spot. The team that should be the most mad right now is BYU because they got put behind multiple one-loss teams whose resumes are not nearly as good as BYU's. And, and people are going to say, that this, this doesn't matter. Yes, it does. It, I'll tell you why it matters. Because BYU, if the season ended today, would have that first round bye. Okay? They would have that first round bye. They would be the number four seed in the college football playoff. And that would be a pretty good situation to be in, right? But here's the problem. With them being ranked ninth by the CFP committee... And Boise State being ranked 12th, that's not a very wide gap. You know what that tells me? Is that BYU might have to be undefeated for them to secure a first round bye. Because if BYU were to lose one here down the stretch, 
They have a tough game this weekend on the road at a very difficult, you know, hostile setting because it's their rival. If they were to lose one at Utah, if they were to lose one at Arizona State on the 23rd of November, uh, I don't know if they'll lose to Kansas at home or Houston at home. If they lose one of those four games, that means that Boise State might be ahead of BYU, which means BYU would not have the benefit of the first round bye. And BYU being nine right now, to me, is completely underrated. I'm not saying that I think BYU is an elite team based off the eye test. No, I think the eye test would tell me that BYU is pretty solid on offense, pretty solid on defense, and pretty solid on special teams. Not super elite in any of the three, but pretty good football team across the board. What I haven't seen from BYU is a, a losing effort, whereas teams in front of them have lost a game. What I also have seen from BYU are two wins against teams right now that are ranked by the College Football Playoff Committee. Because not only do they have a win against SMU, who's number 13 out of the ACC, but they also have a win against number 19, Kansas State. BYU has two wins against teams ranked in the top 19, and they are several spots behind teams that have zero wins in the top 25. And like I said, the reason why it matters is because BYU is running the risk in the event in which they lose a game of potentially not having that first round bye. The other thing about this that is intriguing, if I'm the Big 12 right now, I don't feel real comfortable. And that includes BYU, Iowa State, um, some of the other teams that could Colorado, Kansas State, uh, maybe Texas Tech gets in the gets in the mix at some point here in the near future. The Big 12, we've we've already kind of known this, but I think it's safe to assume, and assuming is dangerous, I get that. It's safe to assume that the Big 12 will have one team in the college football playoff. That was the assumption that we'd been making all season long. So it's not some drastic conclusion that we've now jumped to. But I do think that there was a sliver of hope from Big 12 fans' perspective that if BYU were 12-0 and and lost in the Big 12 championship game, they still might receive an at-large bid from the College Football Playoff Committee. I don't think that's going to happen. Not with where things are right now. BYU's at 9, Iowa State's at 17, Colorado's at 20, Kansas State's at 19. That's it as far as the Big 12 is concerned. And Ward Manuel just told us that who you lost to matters. So if BYU loses to a team that's ranked, say, 21st, that's not going to give them a whole lot of warm fuzzies about keeping BYU in the mix. So if I'm BYU, I'm ticked off, spent enough time on it. Notre Dame, perfectly fine with what Notre Dame is ranked. I continually hear that Notre Dame lost an NIU and they shouldn't have this and they shouldn't have that. Guys, Notre Dame does have a good win against Louisville now. There was a point not that long ago when it looked like Louisville wasn't going to be a very good win for him. There was a point where I didn't think that Notre Dame had a lot of good resume building wins outside of Texas A&M. A&M lost last weekend, but Louisville won, which means things were kind of, you know, worked out, if you will. Louisville now resides in the top 25. So does Texas A&M. Notre Dame's in a really good spot. They went out, they're in. They're going to be just fine. The big question about Notre Dame is whether or not they will host a home playoff game. And at this point, based on what I heard from Ward Manuel, it sounds like there's going to be uh, some acknowledgement of teams that lose on conference championship Saturday. Now, take with take of that what you want, but if I'm Notre Dame, I'm comfortable in knowing I'll be in. I'm comfortable in knowing I'll have a chance, but I'm really uncomfortable because at this point, I don't know for certain that I'm going to be able to host there in South Bend. Alabama's at 11. A lot of people are really frustrated about Alabama being at 11. I personally don't have a big problem with it. They have the opportunity this week to go on the road to LSU. They beat LSU. They're cooking with gas. They lose to LSU. They're out. I think it's pretty simple for Alabama. They also have one of the top wins in the country against Georgia. That Oregon has the top win. They beat Ohio State, who's ranked second, according to the playoff committee. Alabama has the second best win, which is against Georgia, who's the second highest ranked one-loss team. Alabama also, if you look at everyone else they've beat, Alabama has 
Six wins this year. All six of the teams they've beaten have a winning record, including Missouri, who's ranked in the top 25, Georgia, who's ranked number three, South Carolina, who I think has a really strong argument to be ranked, even though they are not, uh, Wisconsin, who that right now, outside of Illinois, is Penn State's best win. That's Alabama's fifth best win. So I look at everything right now, and I kind of am in the line of thought where Alabama's appropriately ranked and in complete control of their own destiny. They went out, they're in. They they lose to LSU, or if they lose one at Oklahoma or against Auburn in the Iron Bowl, they're out. It's pretty simple. Boise State, I think they're ranked a little too high. Uh, but Ward Manuel already told us that Boise State and Ohio State, for that matter, you almost get credit for losing close to a team that's really good. Should you? I don't know. I don't really care that much. Boise State also has a pretty convincing win against Washington State, who is also in the top 20. So I think, or 21, excuse me. So I think Boise's fine. Would I have them down a little bit lower? Yes. But I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep over them being at number 12. I think it's fine at this point. At number 13, 14, 15, and 16. I'm going to bunch these teams together because you have a one-loss SMU team who lost to BYU, who sits at number nine, being ranked against three two-loss SEC teams. Now, we have long pondered whether or not a two-loss SEC would get in against a one-loss ACC team that would get their second loss potentially in the ACC championship game. And if I'm SMU right now at 13, I don't feel real comfortable because I look at some of the meat that's left on the bone for the teams that sit right behind me, and I am now really nervous. Now, SMU wins out, wins the ACC. They're good. They're in first round by, all is set. But in the event in which SMU loses to Miami in the ACC championship game, they're 11 and 2. SMU at that point will have had some pretty good wins, I might add, uh, including having beaten Pitt. And maybe Pitt holds up their end of the bargain continually. But if they lose to Miami, then they're sitting there 11 and 2. All right. AM still has to play against Texas. If AM beats Texas, they're going to vault ahead of SMU in that scenario. If Texas loses to AM, but that's the only game they lose down the stretch, how far do they fall? I don't think they fall past SMU. What about if LSU beats Alabama? If LSU beats Alabama, they're going to vault in front of SMU. Alabama would fall behind SMU, so maybe it's a you know zero sum, whatever. It all balances out, but still. And then I look at Ole Miss. If Ole Miss beats Georgia this weekend, they're going to vault in front of SMU, and I don't think Georgia will fall past SMU. So you're sensing kind of the dilemma here for SMU. They're in a good spot. They should feel comfortable. They control their own destiny. But it feels like they kind of have to win out to be assured of a spot in the college football playoff. Because even if they win out in the regular season and lose in the conference championship, they're probably going to get passed by a two-loss SEC or a two-loss Big Ten at-large team with a comparable resume. Just saying, I wouldn't want to be in SMU's shoes right now with those teams, a and LSU, and Ole Miss right behind them. Iowa State, 7-1, got no problem. Pitt. 7-1, to one, got no problem. Kansas State, I think Kansas State's fine. I don't have an issue with them being where they're at. They beat Colorado head-to-head, -head, so I'm glad they acknowledged that discrepancy. Louisville beat Clemson. Louisville should probably be a little higher than Clemson. I still am trying to figure out why Clemson at this point, outside of knowing that they've dominated some very bad teams. Why is Clemson right now in the top 25? I'm, I'm curious honest question, and this is not knocking on Clemson. I just don't think they've done anything to warrant being in the top 25. Clemson's best win this year against a 5-4 and four NC State team. And I don't think NC State, we've seen NC State against quality competition all year. I don't think NC State's that good of a 5-4 and four team. So Clemson, really to me, has no business being in the top 25. People that are killing Missouri right now for being in the top 25, I understand that. Missouri is six and two, but at least Missouri beat Vandy. Like Vandy is not in the top 25, but at least Vandy is good. NC State has not been this year. So 
I think we right now are looking at teams, say, 23, 24, 25. Army is 25. People are up in arms about why Army is as low as they are. Who have they beaten? That's, I mean, just being honest. And I'm not trying to be facetious. I personally don't think that Army has some super strong resume. I acknowledge that they're undefeated, but so was Navy a couple weeks ago until they actually had to play somebody with a pulse. But I can't justify putting you in the top 15 because you beat Rice and Temple and Tulsa and UAB. The American guys across the board is just not very good. I'm sorry. It's just not very good this year relative to what it's been in years past. Now, you go on the road and beat North Texas this week, pretty good win. You go and handle the environment against Notre Dame, feel pretty good about that possibility as well because the committee just told us they value losses. If you lose close against good teams, you'll get credit. So you have plenty on on the bone here, but to be honest with you, I don't know if I would have had Army in the top 25 right now. Not in front of some of the teams that I think have been left out unnecessarily. To me, I would have taken a really long look at a really long, hard look at Vanderbilt. Uh, Vanderbilt lost to Georgia State, which is egregious, but they lost two other games against ranked teams by a combined six points. Vanderbilt six and three. I think they have a really strong argument that you could make to be in the top 25. Another one is South Carolina. South Carolina is five and three, uh, but they've beaten Texas A&M, who's in the top 15. They smoked Oklahoma. Pretty good win, right? But I'm not, I mean, Texas, I'm not giving Texas credit for Oklahoma, so I probably shouldn't give South Carolina credit whatsoever. But like we said, the committee told us it's who you lost to and how you lost. They lost by two to Bama and they lost by three to LSU. Uh, And if you look at both games, they had a real chance of winning both. So South Carolina would have been another team in the top 25 that I think deserved a little consideration. Other than that, I think it was pretty good. Uh, I really can't sit there and have a ton of issues with some of the other teams that haven't been ranked right now. The only other one that I was thinking maybe should get in is Texas Tech. Texas Tech, six and three. They lost to TCU by one. They lost to Washington State convincingly, and they got beat badly by Baylor, but they lost their quarterback in that game. They do, however, have, I think, two really good wins in the Big 12 right now. One on the road at Iowa State, and they also beat Arizona State. So I'm pretty optimistic about Texas Tech getting consideration, but they got to beat Colorado this week, which will be a difficult game as well. So I don't think the committee did a terrible job. Uh, I think they did a pretty adequate job. But there are certainly a few things that I would have tweaked. And there are a few teams that if I were in their shoes, I'd be pretty frustrated with how things stacked up against me. Since Jack and Mark sit and twiddle their thumbs while we're on the set and they blow up my phone throughout the course of the show, engaging in hypotheticals, we figured who better than to bring them up to the show and to the panel than Mark Kubiak. So Mark, give us some hypotheticals that you would like us to address. All right. First one I have here is how will the committee look at a team if they come in on like a two game losing streak? For example, if Miami loses to Syracuse Thanksgiving weekend and then loses in the ACC championship game, do you think they are set? I think Miami is dead in that scenario. Just being honest with you, because of how the ACC right now is being perceived. If you look at the ACC, how many teams right now do you think are in a really good position for the college football playoff committee? You got Louisville and Clemson, who are sitting there at 22 and 23. You have Pitt, who's sitting there at 18, but with a couple hurdles left on the schedule, like Clemson, in a couple weeks. And then you have SMU, who's sitting there at 13. Right. So you have a scenario where there's a bunch of teams that are not really in a really good spot. So you lose to Syracuse and then you lose to SMU. You're out, I think. But I think let's use a slightly more intriguing scenario. Let's use Oregon. How about Oregon? What if we're sitting there evaluating Oregon, likely the number one ranked team in the country? They lose the week. Right before the Big Ten Championship, they lose to Washington in a rivalry game, which, by the way, is not like out of the realm of possibility. Is it unlikely? Yes. Is it possible? Sure. Let's say Oregon loses that game and then loses in the Big Ten Championship game. So they lose two in a row at the end of the year. Do they still get in? I think they do. 
partly because of how the committee clearly perceives the strength of the Big Ten. How many Big Ten teams are in the top 25? How many Big Ten teams currently reside in the top six? That'd be three in the top six. I think uh, four in the top eight. I think the Big Ten's in a really good spot, as is the SEC. So unfortunately for Miami in the scenario that you just presented, they'd be out, but it's partly because of the strength of schedule that they played throughout and the league not being as deep in the ACC as it is in the SEC or the Big Ten. Not my perception, the committee's perception. I think the ACC is pretty dang good. I just don't know if the committee acknowledges that as much as I do. All right, another one for you here. Let's use Texas and Texas A&M. Let's say Texas loses to Texas A&M in the final week of the season, and there's a little other chaos, and then they meet again in the SEC championship game, and A&M beats them again. A two-loss Texas, you know, three-loss Texas team that has just lost two in a row, do they still get in? No, because one, if Texas loses to AM, they'd have two losses in the SEC. And I think that's unlikely that they even get to the SEC championship game to begin with under that scenario. But I digress. I think Texas with three losses, with a loss in the SEC championship game, would likely be out. Where's their best win in that scenario? Uh, in that scenario, what is Texas's best win? Vanderbilt, hopefully for them, they continue to march along and maybe they knock off Tennessee and maybe Vanderbilt's a really good football team. But Texas's remaining schedule is Florida at Arkansas and Kentucky. They're a heavy favorite in each of those three. None of those three right now are likely to finish the season above 500. So if they were to win those, their best win at the moment right now is against Vandy. Then you lose to AM. Your best win's still Vandy? I don't think that's enough under any circumstance. So no, I don't think a three loss. I know people are already assuming the scenario in which a free three loss team from the SEC or the Big Ten gets in. I don't see it. Could we have chaos the next few weeks? Absolutely. And in the event in which we do, I'm 100% willing to acknowledge the fact that a three loss team might get in. But right now, there's a lot of teams that are playing not such great competition down the stretch. And assuming chalk flies, which is always a dangerous assumption, I just don't think there's going to be enough meat on the bone to get a three-loss team in. All right, and one more here for you. Outside of the SEC and the Big Ten, who do you think the eye test is most important for in the remaining part of the season? Like, you have to win the games that you're favored in. You have to win big. The eye test? Mm, obviously, BYU. I mean, that'd be the easy That'd be the easy answer because I think BYU, not only do they have to win, I think they need to win convincingly. Um, what about Notre Dame? Like if Notre Dame squeaks by Florida state and beats army by three and, you know, gets a two point win at USC, you know, they're going to be 11 and one, but is that going to be an impressive 11 and one with, you know, kind of close wins? I don't, I think Notre Dame in that scenario, if we're talking about making it, versus talking about improving your seating enough to get a home field game, right? Because that's where this conversation will morph here very soon. We're still too far from the finish line to start to evaluate, all right, here's your home games, here's your away games. Like right now, it's like, just get me within striking distance, right? Like that's where my brain's at. I would imagine most teams and players that are watching this show tonight uh, I think they're just thinking, just give me a chance. Just give me in the top 15, 16, 17, and give me a chance. If I can't win my conference, just get me within striking distance. Once we start to move forward just a little bit and the picture becomes a little more clear, then the conversation will become, all right, well, it's really important to get to the eighth seed so I can avoid having to go on the road in the first round of the playoff. We're not there just yet because we don't know the conference – championship situation just yet we don't know exactly how things are going to play out just yet so i think notre dame in the scenario that you just unfolded if notre dame wants to host they need to dominate that i think that's as simple as that if they want to host and i'm not saying them dominating each of the next few games is going to guarantee them a home playoff game i'm not saying that at all i'm just saying their best chance to host is to dominate because unfortunately for Notre Dame, in the event in which Alabama wins this weekend and gets in front of them, certainly a possibility. 
in the event in which LSU wins this weekend, and maybe they get in front of them. I don't I don't know how it's all gonna all gonna work out. You're gonna be based on what Ward Manual told us, you don't want to be sitting at home on conference championship Saturday if you have aspirations of hosting. That's what it seems like. And we don't know. We've never had this scenario. We've never had home playoff games. So your guess is as good as mine. I can just base based off of listening to what those in the room are saying and having a general understanding of how the rankings work, uh, having done this now for 11 years. So I'm pretty optimistic about Notre Dame's chances of getting in, but I am not yet willing to go out on a limb to the point in which I would tell you, yes, go ahead and cancel your weekend plans on the 20th or 21st because you're going to have a home playoff game. Hey, that'll do it for us here at Always College Football. Please like, rate, and subscribe to the show wherever you get your show. I'm Greg McElroy. We hope you enjoyed the college football playoff rankings reveal. We will be back here every Wednesday from this point forward kind of talking about what just went down on the playoff show. Look, the playoff show's an hour. It's awesome. I love being a part of it. I get to learn a lot. And, and watching and listening and getting to see how these things all unfold. So I get to learn a lot, and I'm really interested to see where things go from here. But we'll be here every single Tuesday night and or Wednesday morning to help break it down and spend a little more time when we don't have that time available to us in the College Football Playoff Ranking Show. So for all of us here at ACF, for Mark, Jake, Jack, the other Jack, I'm Greg. By the way, how good was Mark in asking those questions? I mean, he was just silky smooth fluidity. Unbelievable. He was sitting there just thinking, how do I get Notre Dame a home playoff game, wasn't he? He's like, I'll spin it however I can spin it. I just need to get Notre Dame a home playoff game. I know your tricks, Coops. I know your tricks. But for all of us here at ACF, including our resident Irish homer, Mark Kubiak. I'm Greg McElroy. I hope you have an amazing day. And we'll check back with you tomorrow on Thursday's edition where we preview all this weekend's games on Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.